So what is mathematical modeling? So mathematical modeling is a process um, where you're basically, you're taking real life stuff and then you're translating them into algebraic expressions or equations. And so that's the kind of stuff that happens in real life. Um, in real life, you're not usually given equations to solve. You have to do work with models. Um, so the process for mathematical modeling relies on your critical thinking skills, your problem solving skills, your ability to translate word and phrases into their mathematical meaning, and just how well you understand math concepts. Because if you don't understand the underlying concepts, then it's going to be really difficult for you to model. Um, so if you're saying, oh, I'm not going to need algebra when you're graduating or, you know, after this class or I don't need it for a degree, the critical thinking and the problem solving in this process is what you are learning. That's what this class is giving you. This class is giving you experience with those skills and those skills are needed in any job. So not everything in this class, you may not be solving equations for your job, but you still need to know how to think. Um, do critical thinking, problem solving, and that's what math can teach you through mathematical modeling. So um, I have a link here of real world uses of mathematical modeling, and I strongly recommend that you take a look at that because it goes through how computer science uses mathematical models, how medicine uses mathematical models. It has a whole bunch of different applications, and I think you may be surprised at just how much this stuff is used in people's daily lives and in your careers. So some tips for successful uh, modeling is I do recommend to keep a list handy of common words and phrases and how they translate. Like the word less than usually actually translates as subtraction. Uh, you should also keep a list of common formulas and equations that are used in modeling. Uh, that way, because you'll see a lot of the same types of equations, like there's a lot of models that are based off of the equation of a line. Um, there's distance equals rate times time. That's a very common model. You have the simple interest formula. So keep those handy because you'll be seeing those over and over again, and that will help you um, be successful when you're modeling because you'll be like, oh, this uses this formula. This one uses this one. Draw pictures whenever possible. I'm a very visual learner. I know a lot of people are and drawing pictures can help you process the information and what you're supposed to do. And always write down what you know and what you need to find. So that way you know your goal. What information do you have? What is your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? Because if you don't have that in your head, then you don't really have a direction to go. So these are handy, especially in real life, because a lot of times in real life you're finding area things of rectangles and squares and that sort of stuff. So um, definitely keep this handy. Common formulas. So like the formulas to convert between temperatures. Simple interest. Compound interest. Compound interest I use all the time for determining how much interest I'm going to get on like my bank accounts and my um, savings accounts and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then the distance formula that I mentioned before. Distance equals rate times time. So those are very common and definitely keep those handy. Okay, so problem solving procedure. I figured it'd be helpful so you have an idea of what you should be doing to help you stay on the right track. So the first step is to read. Read the problem. And when you're reading the problem, you may have to read it multiple times. Um, but you want to read it, draw diagrams or make tables, anything you need to do to help you process what's going on and process the information. So in the, when you're reading it, when you're working through it, write down and label everything you're being told. You know, you're given a number. What does this number represent? What are the units on this number? Um, anything that involves distance, uh, I usually draw pictures. You know, even if it's like an area problem or perimeter or geometry kind of stuff, I draw pictures. That's all part of the reading where you're trying to piece together and parse the information. Your next step is to assign a variable to represent your unknown value. Or if there's more than thing that you're that are unknown, you may have to assign multiple variables. But you need to that's where you determine what am I looking for? What do I not know that I need to know? And so give it a letter. Give it a letter that makes sense. If you're finding distance, call it D. Don't call it X because then you're it's not going to be as meaningful. And write down what the variable represents. Like D equals distance from this to this. You know, be very specific. 
that helps you understand what is this number that you're um, finding. And then if there's, if there's more than one unknown value, maybe you, know, you don't know length, you don't know width, but you know width is twice length, you can write that down as well. Um, so as part of this assigning a variable, sometimes you're also starting to write expressions and then you write your equations and that's where you put together the information. Um, usually you've got one equation, sometimes you may have two equations. Sometimes you have more, but most of the time you just have one or two. And once you've got your equation, then, then it's back to the regular algebra where you solve the equation. So that part's not bad. So the hardest part is reading the problem, making sure you get the right variables and that you've set your equation up correctly. Once you have your equation, you just solve. But you always want to check your answer. So you want to make sure it works in the equation. But you also have to make sure the number makes sense. If you're solving for distance and you get a negative number for distance, that's a sign that you messed up. Either you solved incorrectly or your model, your equation was wrong. So if you checked it in your equation and it worked in your equation, that tells you, oh, I set my equation up wrong. Um, so you want to make sure the numbers you get make sense. And you also have to make sure you're answering the original question, because a lot of times you're solving for something, you get an answer, but that's not actually what the question is asking for. So you need to make sure once you have a number that that's what the question is asking about. And then once you've determined that, yes, your answer works in the equation, it makes sense, and answers what the question is, you state the answer to the problem. This is usually a sentence where you actually give, you don't just say x equals 2, because someone who's looking at this may not know what x means. Um, so you could say the distance between point A and B is five miles, or something like that. State it in a sentence, making sure you are answering the question. That's the kind of thing that you need to do in real life. Um, you, when you give your answers to problems, you don't just give a number, you have to explain what that means. And so this is a good process. This is like what you do in real life. So, um, the distance your car travels in, I think that was supposed to be the variable didn't copy over T hours, T for time, at a rate of 55 miles per hour. So notice that that is not a complete sentence. It is not a complete sentence, which means that you are writing an expression, not an equation. Expression does not have an equal sign. Um, it's a phrase. So the distance it would be miles and defined miles we if we have something miles per hour so that's 55 miles per hour if you multiply that by the number of hours your per hour and your hours cancel and that gives you your distance so here's an example where i've translated this using uh, my knowledge of how units work and how you can cancel things out if you're taking your speed times time that will give you your distance and I don't have this equal to anything because it's an expression. It's, it's a phrase, not a sentence. Second one here, we have the total cost of producing X units for which the fixed costs are 2,500 and the cost per unit is 40. So we're looking at the total cost. So total cost, you have your fixed costs. Those don't change. So the 2,500. And then on top of that is the extra cost. So that's added on. So I'm going to have a plus sign. And if it's $40 per unit, then you need to multiply $40 by the number of units to find out how much that costs in total. So that would be plus 40x. And this is, again, looking at the unit cost or the, yeah, the units, cost per unit divided by units. If I multiply by the number of units, those cancel out. Now, if you have an algebraic equation, that's when you actually have a sentence, a complete thought. So the discount D is 30% of the list price. So that's a complete sentence. Okay. When we're translating these and writing them in an equations, the word is means equals. So I have equals, and then it has D on the left. So D equals, now 30% of. In this type of situation, of usually means multiplying. So you're multiplying your list price by 30%, which we will convert to a decimal, which is 0.3. So your discount is equal to 0.3L. So of means multiply, so I'm multiplying the 30% times L. 
And that's my equation. Second one here, we have the sales for this month, J, R. R is that verb. That's where the equal sign is. So it, math is like a language. Where the verb is, that's where your equal sign shows up. So J equals, they are 20% greater. So they are 20% greater than the sales from last month. So greater than, these we tend to translate backwards. So we have last month's sale. And then we're adding on 20%. But when you do 20%, you always have to multiply it by something. It's 20% of what last month was. So it's greater than because we're adding, and we're not adding 0 0.2. It's not 20 cents greater. It's 20% in percents get multiplied by something. So it gets multiplied by what last month's sales were. So if they're 20% greater, you have last month's sales, and then you're adding in more. And that's how you get this equation, which actually we can simplify to 1.20m. So whenever you are finding um, a, anything with a percent, if you're adding on, it's usually one point and then whatever that percent is. And this is actually very handy in real life if you're trying to find out how much to tip or what the total is with tip. If you're tipping 20%, multiply your bill by 1.2, and that will tell you your total with tip. So that's a good skill to know on how to add in percents to something. And that's by multiplying one point something. You can do that with tax, too. If you're trying to figure out if your tax is 10%, multiply your total by 1.1, and then that will tell you the total with tax. Okay, so now here are some models. A salesperson's weekly paycheck is 15% less than a second salesperson's paycheck. The two paychecks total 1,125. Find the amount of each paycheck. So I start by reading through the sentence, the, the problem, and then I'm thinking, okay, there's not really a picture to draw here, but I have two things to find because it says to find the amount of each paycheck. So there's two paychecks. So we can call those X and Y. So we can say, okay, our paychecks are X and Y. And so we're trying to find out how much both of those paychecks are. So that's my unknown. And then I'm given some information. The easiest thing to translate, it says the two paychecks total 1,125. That means when you add them together, that that's the total. So when I add paycheck one, X, plus paycheck two, which is Y, that is equal to 1,125. So I have an equation. This is where I said you may get two equations out of here, because you, you might have two variables. So let's go back to that first sentence. Salesperson weekly paycheck is, so I'm gonna translate it like I did the other one. So weekly paycheck, and it doesn't matter which salesperson this is, so let's say X, is, so that's my equal sign, 15% less than the second one. So this is similar to the example I did with the months. If it's a percent more, you add it on. Here we're going to be subtracting. And so we take that second paycheck and then we're subtracting 15% of that paycheck. So then I have to subtract that by 0.15y. So when you have percents, you're usually adding or subtracting. And so your thing in front, when, if I simplify that 1 minus 0.75, or 0.15, sorry, that's 0.85y. So you're either going to get a number that's 1 minus the percent or 1 plus the percent, basically. So we have here two equations. But what I know is that x is equal to point 85y. So I have x in this second equation. I can replace that with what it's equal to. 0.85y plus y equals 1,125. Okay, now I've created my model. So I took all of my information. I translated the sentences. Now I've actually got my model, my equation I can solve. And so now I can add 
I can combine my like terms, 0.85 plus y, or plus 1, basically. So we get 1.85 y equals 1,125. And then I'm solving for a y. So I divide both sides by 1.85. And putting, getting my calculator out. OK. Yep, just making sure that I did my math right because I got a really nasty decimal. <laughs> So we get 608. Usually they make these things work out very nicely. Um, I get several decimals because this is in dollars. We're rounding to one def or two decimal places. So that comes out to 608.11. So that's one person's paycheck, 608.11. $608.11. So here's where you say, okay, I got a number. Does this number make sense? Does this make sense for a paycheck? Yes. Because it's we've got two decimal places for dollars. It's above zero. Um, we need to check our answer. So I'm going to do it very quickly. I'm not going to bother showing the work. And I did have to round, so it's not going to be exact. But it comes out close enough. I have because of the rounding. So number works. Okay, did I answer the question? The question says find the amount of each paycheck. I only found one paycheck. So now I need to find out what the other paycheck is. So we have that expression that I highlighted 0.85y. X is equal to 0.85y. So x is equal to 0.85 times what y is equal to. And that gives me six or five hundred and sixteen dollars and eighty nine cents when I round it, round it to two decimal places. And now I'm gonna just double check that these add up. When I add these together, I do get one thousand one hundred twenty five, so that comes out even. So now I've got the amount of each paycheck, but we want to state this in words. So we can say one paycheck is 608.11 and the other is 516.89. And there you go. Now you've gone through the problem, the problem solving process. Let's look at this other example. And this one is um, sort of relevant for everybody. This um, problem, this process, what I do in this example is not going to be exactly how things work in our class. Um, but you can do the same sort of thinking if you want to figure it out for our class. So. For in this process, in this example, to get an A in a course, you must have an average of at least 90% on four tests worth 100 points each. Your scores so far are 87, 92, and 84. What must you score on the fourth test to get an A in the course? Okay, so you, your unknown thing is what are you going to have on that, X, that test? So we can just call that X. What is the score we want to have at least 90? So we have to think here. It says you must have an average. So what does it mean to find the average? You are taking the total divided by the number of things you have, which I'll just call it n. So we want our total scores divided by how many things we have. So our total scores right now, 87 plus 92 plus 84, and then when we have that fourth one, that would be x. Okay. So it says these tests are worth 100 points each. 
So that means when I add these together, the total for four tests is 400 points. So if I want to find my average as a decimal, I would divide that by 400. Um, if, say, these tests were worth 200 points, then I would do 4 times 200, and that would get me 800. You'd be dividing by 800. But here, our tests are worth 100 points, and this gets me a percent. And if we want to just not have it as a decimal, we'd multiply that by 100, and we want that to be at least 90. So let's find out what we would need to get exactly 90, and then go from there. So I basically talked, in order to get this equation, I talked through, you know, what we're doing. We've got an average. Okay, what are the total number of points out of those four tests? 400 points. That's going to give me a decimal. I multiply 100 to get the percent because that's what a percent is, and we want at least 90%. So let's look at that cutoff. So I've kind of talked it out here. So let's add, let's simplify this. So first let's add those three test scores together, 87 plus 92 plus 84. We get 263, then plus x, and then I'm actually going to switch, just switch ink color here. I've got 100 and 400. I can divide 100 out of both of those, and so I can just divide this by, oops, 4, and then that equals 90. So now, I can multiply both sides by 4 to get rid of the fraction. So I get 263 plus x equals 360. And then I'm solving for x, so I subtract both sides. Uh, the 263 from both sides, I'm running out of room here. So 360 minus 263, x equals 97. So I got a number for x, so let's go back. What are we looking for? What is x, the score in a test? Does a 97 out of 100 make sense? Yes, you can do that. If you got a number um, greater than 100, what that would tell you in this case is that it's impossible to get a 90 because you can't get a score over 100. If your answer doesn't make sense, then the situation can't happen. Um, you can't make, you know, you can't get, to, you got something false, so you can't get equal to a 90. So here, x is our score in the fourth test. We'd have to get a 97 to get exactly a 90, or higher than that in order to get something greater than 90%. So when you answer the question in words, you would have to score at least a 97 on the fourth test to get a 90%. So you would have to score... at least a 97 on the fourth test to get an A in the course. So that's it. So um, the problem solving is a lot of like talking with yourself, saying, what does this mean? Okay, what do I know? I know what the word average means. Okay, now that I know that, let's piece things together. And a lot of this also comes from experience. Like, how did I know that I needed to put 400 on the bottom or multiply 100? That comes from practice. So that's why we do these problem solving things, is so that you can get the practice and experience with the different types of problems, so that when you see these pop up, you have more things in your problem solving bucket that you can use. So um, that's, that's basically it.